Hello, this lecture is on the progressive era. In the late 19th and early 20th century, American intellectuals and reformers felt a sense of urgency to heal what they viewed was an unwell nation. Late 19th century populism, an agrarian movement, and early 20th century progressivism, a reform movement, sought to improve society. Reformers addressed the grievances of workers, farmers, women, and African Americans, and encouraged the early rise of statism. With this focus on farmers, populism was a political party from 1891 to around 1900. In 1891, the People's Party, or also the Populist Party, the People's Party was created from a coalition of farmers and laborers. The People's Party advocated the free coinage of silver, a graduated income tax, and government control of railroads. According to populists, free coinage of silver and thus an expanded currency would give the American public a more accessible currency than was the case of currency based on gold, which was rarer and expensive. Increasing the rate of taxation on rising incomes, the graduated income tax would make wealthier citizens pay proportionally more taxes than anyone else. The goal of having government controlled, controlling railroads was to lessen the power of the wealthy railroad businessmen. There were critics who labeled the populists as hayseed socialists. Many historians claim that the robber baron label was invented and popularized by Kansas farmers and others in the Midwest who were critical of the masters of the railway system. But the term itself was used in a New York Times editorial in the late 1850s. The key point is to recognize there was a pro-populist contribution by intellectuals living in, in Atlantic seaboard cities. So what we have is just a, a word of explanation here. We, in this time period, you would have others who would um, refer to the captains of industry, these industrialists, as robber barons. And this was something that uh, socialists certainly did. This is a term that they, they would use. But the po populace, the, people, the People's Party itself, there were some that would refer to that, that entity as hayseed socialists. In the ninth sorry, in the 1892 presidential election, the People's Party presidential candidate, James Weaver, received approximately 1 million votes or 8.5% of the votes. Four years later, populists supported Democrat leader, William Jennings Bryan, who was sympathetic to some of the demands of the populace. With Bryan's loss to Republican William McKinley, populism increasingly lost political steam. Also, at the national level was the Progressive Party led by Theodore Roosevelt from 1912 to 1916. So when we're talking about progressivism, uh, there's certainly a clear connection between the, the populist in the late 1800s and the progressives a little later. But you have two parties. You have the People's Party, 
in the late 1800s, and then you have the Progressive Party. The Progressive Party was a Republican splinter group that focused on the goal of government regulation of business. Although in 1912, Democrat Woodwell Wilson defeated Roosevelt, the election represented the high mark for progressivism. It should be stressed that Wilson pushed through progressive acts that took aim at monopolistic business practices. So Woodwell Wilson uh, also was attuned to these uh, progressive ideas, including the uh, criticism of monopolies. Progressivism as a way of thinking existed before the Progressive Party. While progressivism has many meanings, it tended to be based on the central assumption that society needed and could be improved under the direction of experts. The progressive impulse included the spirit of anti-monopoly, a commitment to rational procedures, and a belief in the importance of order and efficiency. Progressive reformers were interested in professionalism and increasing their social status. A component of progressism had roots in liberal Christianity. The social gospel was part of an emerging liberal movement in American religion that focused on social reform to alleviate poverty slums and labor grievances. Theolo theologians associated with the social gospel discredited the literal accuracy of the Bible and em emphasized instead its general moral and ethical lessons. Distinct themselves from the social gospel movement that was gaining strength among some ministers in the United States, traditional Christians believed that clergymen were not to pre preach science, literature, and social reform. Rather, their mission was to preach sin and salvation since the world could not survive without Christ. D.L. Moody lamented, quote, there is so much talk of reform, 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 till I am sick of the whole thing. What is wanted is to preach Christ in season and out of season. Moody understood that the building of a kingdom of God on earth was impossible to achieve because all people are corrupt. He told revival audiences, we are naturally bad. Who in this audience would be willing to have his heart photographed with all its real thoughts and passions brought to light? Moody desired that individuals reach for Christ's kingdom, but the kingdom he referred to was not a kingdom of God on earth, but it was almost exclusively the kingdom of heaven. So when it comes to the re religion, it's the more modernist approach, the more social gospel approach that was aligned with um, progressivism. D.L. Moody uh, endorsed a premillennial understanding of end times, the belief that the millennium or 1,000 years of righteousness could only begin with the physical arrival of Jesus. And he argued that churches were negligent in failing to preach the second coming of Christ. His pessimism was contrary to the post-millennialism that 19th century liberal, liberal Protestants accepted. Many lay Protestants agreed with him that an individual needed to experience conversion to Christ, and most Protestants of the late 19th century promoted spiritual salvation over social salvation, since they believed that personal salvation was the first step for solving social problems. Ironically, the social gospel clergy who focus on the grievances and the needs of workers were the very ones who were likely to water down the biblical message that many workers welcome. So studies in this 
in this era show that there were a significant number of you know working people that would be drawn to these various uh, revival meetings that were taking place where uh, where there was a biblical message but moody and others like him the more traditional christians believe that for solving social problems it started with uh, individual salvation so this was a contrast to the message of progressivism. Now, whether religious or not, reformers sought to reform the social, economic, and political structure of the United States because they found aspects of the transformation of late 19th century worrying. Well, from, from 1870 to 1900, the population almost tripled, agricultural production doubled, and the value of manufacturers grew sixfold. Population growth was beneficial for the nation, but the issue of urban crowding required attention. More food production and manufacturing gave Americans a higher standard of life, but reformers wanted to see that no Americans were left out. Railway mileage increased from 53,000 miles in 1870 to 200,000 miles by 1900, but approximately two thirds of the nation's railways were controlled by only several major business groups. Critics especially referred to the so-called robber barons Jay Gould a stock manipulator and expert in railroad stock, and Cornelius Vanderbilt, a big time tycoon. Historian Paul Johnson writes that American businessmen often broke the law when they saw it as monopolistic. Vanderbilt came to see the law as something created in favor of one group of manipulating members of state legislatures or paying expensive lawyers to win court decisions. This business activity could not continue with such brazenness. But sorting out what was good and what was evil was not an easy, ta uh, was not an easy task. Reformers themselves could be self-serving, dedicated to reclaiming their importance in the face of the overwhelming power of big business. For some reformers, for some progressives, the American myth appeared to be dying. Things were not getting better in, the, in how they viewed it. With the rise of trust, and combines, there was a concentration of power in these uh, private uh, and, and larger corporations. The bribing of legislatures and Congress uh, politicians was scandalous. And, and they were wondering, was the Republic turning into an aristocracy of capital? Some workers faced new pressures. With the ad advent of job simplification and standardization, many skilled workers lost some status. Labor unionists lamented that many of, of those in semi-skilled positions were newly arrived er immigrants who often lacked traditions of labor uh, resistance and organization. Progressives wanted better wages and working conditions for those employed in manufacturing industries. Reformers also attempted to improve the condition of struggling farmers. Farmers had to shift, uh, ship their produce on monopoly railroads that were costly. They ex farmers experienced bouts when there was a long-term decline in commodity prices caused by domestic overproduction and growing international competition for world markets. Frustrating the farmers, frustrating the farmers were high tariffs. Manufacturers were protected, but farmers were not. Farmers sold their products 
at low prices in competitive foreign markets, but had to purchase their farm machinery at elevated prices due to high tariff prices. Many, many farmers were in debt and the problem caused by in, an inadequate currency and in circulation made matters worse. Farmers had other challenges. They generally worked longer hours than industrial workers. The average farmer's week was 68 hours compared to the average 56 hours for those employed in manufacturing industries. Farm children spent less time in school than city children, and they left school at an earlier age. Agrarian protests, however, did simmer down when the four-year depression of 1893 and 1896 ended. The farmers were doing better. And one reason, some argue, was the major discoveries of gold. The increased supply of gold put more money in, in the economy and farmers' debt burden began to ease. Progressives challenge women's suffrage, or champion, sorry, champion women's suffrage. In the 19th century, getting the vote was low for, uh, was a low priority for American women. Women activists were enthusiastic with abolitionism and temperance, but less so for women's suffrage. This began to change in the late 1800s. The National American Women Suffrage Movement increased its membership from 13,000 in the year 1893 to 2 million in the year um, 1917. In 1916, both the Republican Party and the Democratic Party endorsed women's suffrage. In 1919, there were 15 states who granted full suffrage to men. The following year, the 19th Amendment gave the vote to all American women. The first section read, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or, or by any state on account of sex. So 1920, we now, all women have the vote. One notable feature of the progressive era was the impact of crusading journalists. Known as muckrakers, these journalists typically targeted captains of industry. In the 1880s, the New York City-based Puck, a satirical publication, ran cartoons that attacked railroad industrialists. Another major publication was McClure's magazine that published articles by muckrakers such as Lincoln Stevens, who wrote about corruption in the cities, and Ida Tar Tarbell, who wrote about uh, Standard Oil. The writers generally lacked objectivity, but they wrote persuasively. Ida Tarbell was extremely critical of Rockefeller and Standard Oil. Um, she saw Rockefeller, who she believed was responsible for putting her father an independent oil producer out of business. Her brother also worked for a competing oil company. And thus, there, were, there was ample motivation for her to attack uh, Rockefeller. Some of her interpretations were wrong, but her successful writing demonstrated that muckraking and political agitation could even, quote, defeat a competitive product enjoyed by millions of consumers, end of quote. 
Rockefeller was naive to believe that facts would speak for themselves. As one historian writes, Rockefeller's facts were dwarfed by the negative publicity from McClure's, from editorial pages, and finally from the White House. Although S.S. McClure, the founder of McClure's magazine was a chronic adulterer, he was able to recruit good writers who were eager to, eager to shape the nation with um, often emotional arguments of America's shortcomings. Overall, the impact of progressivism was lasting. Progressives and activists represented a remarkably mixed bag of characters, eccentrics, and prophets. The gains that resulted from progressive activity cannot be denied. At the first broad-based national, as the first broad-based national reform movement, it built the foundation of the modern activist state. However, the progressive failed to advance the rights of African Americans. So just as a bit of um, a review, they, they made some headway on the issue of suffrage and women getting the vote. They raised some awareness of some of the grievances that workers had. Uh, and also some of the issues that concern farmers. But as far as any kind of improvements with the African Americans as a result of progressive ideas, it did not happen. Neither the populists nor progressives made race relations a priority. Race received little attention from progressives. As one historian writes, African-Americans face greater obstacles than any other group in challenging their own oppressed status and seeking reform. At the end of Reconstruction, most Southern Democrats wanted to see suppression of the Black vote. Initially, this was achieved by terror and fraud. The next tactic was by legislation that found ways to get around the 15th Amendment that assured all males the right to vote, regardless uh, whether you are Black or white, or in all races, anyone could vote, males could vote. With literacy tests, poll taxes, and property requirements, states in the South established Black disenfranchisement. An example of this, in Louisiana, uh, the uh, one election, election there, there were 130,000 Blacks who voted, 130,000. Four years later, the number was drastically reduced to be around 5,000. In the South, the Democratic Party was successful in assuring its political hegemony. Violence against Blacks persisted. And in the 1890s, for example, approximately 100 Blacks were lynched every year, many victims many victimized on the grounds of unsubstantiated accusations. There were, few, there were a few populists who fought racism. Uh, one example is George's Tom Watson. He, and he stated in 1892, quote, now the People's Party says to these men, and that's referring to a, a black farmer and a white farmer, quote, you are kept apart that you may be separately fleeced of your earnings. You are made to hate each other because upon that hatred is rested the keystone of the arch of financial despotism which enslaves you both. You are deceived and blinded that you may not see this race antagonism perpetuates a monetary system which beggars both." End of quote. 
Well, broad minded words indeed. Unfortunately, later in the decade, while Watson, the politician, was leading night riders against black citizens. One historian writes, quote, Watson's odyssey to almost complete capitulation to racist precepts followed a typically human path, buffeted by the winds of conformity, lured by the temptations of political gain, and tormented by changes of mood and fortune, he vacillated. So early, he seemed to, to show some sympathy to Blacks, uh, but that did not last. Another supporter of the People's Party was Mary E. Lease, one of the few female lawyers in the late 1800s. She flirted with socialism and later the progressivism of Theodore Roosevelt. Her book, The Problem, Civil, the Problem of Civilization Solved, and this was published in 1895, promoted the idea of a global separation of the races in which whites dominated everyone. Into the 20th century, the progressive movement accomplished little for African Americans. So you, we look at the People's Party, the populace in the late 1800s, their record is not that good. And neither were, neither, it was the same uh, pretty much for, for the progressive movement. They, they accomplished very little. In the South, progressism was deemed for whites only. Throughout the nation, local Jim Crow laws imposed strict segregation. Blacks were segregated on streetcars, trains, schools, parks, public buildings, and cemeteries. Seeking employment in Northern factories, Blacks who moved to the North ended up in rundown districts and worked, um, um, worked at, many of them working in, uh, you know, having menial jobs. Now there were, there were uh, others who, who did uh, much better working in uh, various factories, for example, the, the car industry, uh, Ford, Ford, and, and other um, other kind of manufacturing industries where the pay was was better uh, for blacks. Their children tended to they they would more or less attend uh, really rundown schools. And basically, what we see is that many uh, back in the in the South, many Southern progressives saw legalized segregation as a as a progressive reform. So both in, in the South and the North, um, the picture is uh, rather bleak. The philosophy of Booker T. Washington, focusing on economic rather than political advancement, was challenged by Black reformers. Washington was an educationist who wrote up from slavery. This was published in 1901. And one message to African Americans was to, quote, get some property, get a home on your own, end of quote. Well, co founder of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, and later socialist W.E. Dubois believe Washington's ideas were unnecessarily limiting to Blacks. So there was a strong debate between Washington and Dubois. Dubois, who later became a, a socialist, was uh, you know, far more critical of the social political structure of America, whereas Washington was uh, more sympathetic and wanting to work within the parameters of what, what society offered. 
Some progressives, such as settlement house worker Mary White Ovington, played a part in the creation of the NAACP. Overall, however, progressivism's record on the issue of racial justice was poor. Progressivism was largely a middle-class movement that was reluctant to fight for racial justice. Stronger Black civil and political rights were years away. And in essence, we're, we're talking decades. In conclusion, progressivism was a response by reformers to industrialization and its social byproducts. This included immigration, urban growth, and the concentration of corporate power. Progressivism shaped populist ideals, but progressivism's strength was in the cities rather than in rural areas. Consequently, there were more journalists, academics, and social theorists supporting progressivism than had been the case with populism. While progressives thought to reform society, they, um, what, what, they were not um, uh, revolutionaries, okay? So the progressives were reformers. They were not revolutionaries. Progressives desired a particular form of bigger government that was milder than socialism in method and practice. Socialists, on the other hand, believe, believe reform was not enough. They wanted to see the deaths of the free enterprise system. Eugene V. Debs was the presidential candidate of the Socialist Party. And in the 1900 election, the party only received about 95,000 votes. And just as a comparison, the, the victor was uh, William McKinley. Uh, the Republican Party won the presidency with over uh, 7 million votes, followed closely by William Jennings Bryan, who represented kind of both the Democrats and the Populist Party at 6.5 million. So the, the 95,000 votes was, was, was pretty small in comparison. Progressivism's most notable failure was on African-American issues. So Southern politics dominated by the Democratic Party was not good for Blacks. Unfortunately, the record of Northern political leaders, regardless of the party and activists of all stripes, was hardly commendable either. Economist Murray Rothbard is critical is critical of the larger progressive movement, viewing it as the beginnings of greater statism and a flawed political economic system. And he argues, quote, the rapid surge of statism in this period was propelled by a coalition of two broad groups, A, certain big business groups anxious to replace a roughly laissez-faire economy by a new form of mercantilism, cartelized and controlled and subsidized by a strong government under their influence and control, and B, newly burgeoning group of groups of intellectuals, technocrats, and professionals economists, writers, engineers, planners, physicians, etc., anxious for power and lucrative employment at the hands of the state. So Rothbard offers uh, quite, um, quite a blunt uh, critique of progressivism. Whether or not progressivism was successful makes for a good debate. Certainly, progressive ideas had left a lasting effect. Historian Paul Johnson writes 
quote, gradually the progressive intelligentsia and the bulk of the Democratic Party began to see a strong federal government with wide powers of intervention as the defender of the ordinary man and woman against the excesses of corporate power. The notion of the public sector, which was good, uh, needed to be expanded as opposed to the private sector, which was potentially bad and needed to be regulated, began to take possessions of the minds of the do-gooders." End of quote. Thank you. <laughs>